Okay, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Daniel Bum. He's a professor for mathematics at Stanford. And he works on representation theory and autom automorphic forms. And if you don't know what it is, I don't know either, it's hard to explain, but um, it has some general relationship to this kind of toy, which I think most of you are familiar with. And he also uses this actually in his own teaching to explain to students uh, these kind of concepts. And I think um, this also shows a general thing that many mathematicians actually love games and toys. And um, uh, playing games uh, actually has also informed lots of interesting uh, mathematics. And one of the uh, other uh, games that uh, Daniel loves is the game of Go. It's an ancient game. It's one of the oldest games uh, we know and that it's still playing. And um, uh, Daniel was actually a co-author on GNU Go, which was one of the uh, first free Go programs of reasonable strengths in the uh, 1990s. And you may have heard the news of the last uh, couple of weeks where um, Computer Go has made a tremendous advancement. So there was this uh, program AlphaGo, which beat one of the uh, best, uh, world best players. And um, this is not only a significant advancement for uh, the game of Go and computer Go, but also artificial intelligence in general. And so it's very timely uh, to have him uh, here today to speak uh, about uh, talk, a very simple title, uh, Computer Go. So welcome. So this talk is going to be sort of a mixture of um, uh, discussion of the history of computer Go and uh, some technical issues. And I hope to end uh, looking a little bit at the, at the uh, 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 developments of the last 10 and 5 years, and, uh, and particularly the, the AlphaGo match. Um, so the very first uh, uh, computer program that anybody is aware of was written in uh, 1968 by Zobrist, who uh, uh, was a uh, doctoral student at the University of Wisconsin. And his program was somewhat ahead of his time because it used concepts uh, that have proved important. Uh, one is Zobris hashing, which we'll probably touch on, and, and then there's the influence function, which we'll definitely touch on. Um, and uh, beyond this, um, uh, uh, things started to happen in the 1980s. Uh, uh, Usenix was a U Unix users group, and uh, around 1984, they started having Go tournaments. The second one is in Portland, and I happened to be there. Uh, although I, didn't, uh, I wasn't involved in computer bro programming at the time, um, I happened to be in the room when this tournament was held. And it was organized by Peter Langston, who was a musician, is a musician, and, and, uh, uh, and, and also a, 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 a programmer. And, and, uh, they played, they played the tournament on Sun workstations, as I recall, and, and uh, uh, there were glitches. Uh, Nemesis crashed, and, and uh, although Nemesis was the strongest program and was favored to win, it didn't win. Instead, of, uh, one of Peter Langston's two programs won. Uh, it was at Portland State University. It was quite interesting, but everything was very primitive. So in the 1990s, things started to talk, uh, take off. And I'll mention some particular programs. Um, Handtalk was the, pro the strongest uh, uh, program, at least for a while. Many Faces of, of Go was written by David Fotland, who, who uh, uh, I believe was, was an engineer at uh, Hewlett Packard, and eventually retired to work full time on his Go program. Um, uh, other well known programs were Goliath, Smart Go, Nemesis, which I've already uh, mentioned. Go4++ and a strong program from, uh, from North Korea. Um, and uh, uh, all of these programs were uh, uh, sort of, um, they, weren't, they were strong enough to give, a, give an amateur, a weak amateur, a challenge, but not a, uh, um, not a, uh, a player of even middle amateur strength. The, so the, the ratings of them were something like 9Q or something like that, uh, if you know what that means. Quite weak, um, but s still strong enough to be interesting, and th that programming issues came up. Uh, computers, well, uh, 
laptop computers didn't really exist yet, uh, uh, you, but you did have PCs, and you could connect two PCs together with a uh, with a cable and start a program on one PC and and uh, and uh, and another program on another PC. And every if everything worked, then the two programs could play, and there was a protocol for for exchanging the moves. Every byte, uh, every individual byte contained um, contained a move, and and uh, so they were not readable, human readable, um, but um, if everything went well, then the two computers could play. And this is how tournaments were con con uh, conducted. Um, around 1992, uh, the Go culture seemed to, uh, uh, started to change because of the rise of Go servers. So there were chess servers that were starting to, to come up. And uh, the Go servers, uh, uh, the internet Go server, server was started by Tim Casey, who was here in Mountain View, and Mark Okada in San Francisco. They moved their server around from, from New Mexico to Pennsylvania to San Francisco. And eventually, they, they sold it to, uh, to um, Pandanet in Japan, and, and now it, it is, is Pandanet. There was another server called the, the NNGS server, which um, copied the IGS protocol so that the, the, uh, the clients that were written by third party people for IGS could use the uh, uh, NNGS server, and, um, uh, and uh, the IGS people were quite bitter about this and quite angry about it, and so there were um, a lot of very hostile um, uh, uh, email messages and so forth going back and forth. Um, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, NNGS went out of business, but for a while they were, they were where most of the uh, uh, programs between Go, uh, the, the matches between Go programs took place. Now things have moved to KGS, which is uh, um, a server based in Portland, Oregon. So uh, the, the first programs had to have their own, they were commercial programs, and they had to have their own built-in graphical user interface so that people can stand to play with them. And you basically loaded the, the so software onto your uh, computer and then played with it. But with the servers, clients began to, to be developed, and those were capable of interacting uh, independently with the server or with the, uh, with the program or with, with the human. And so things changed, and they got a lot nicer when, when, uh, um, when, when, uh, when this happened. Uh, the Go modem protocol that I mentioned went out the door when a uh, reasonable ASCII pro protocol was developed by, uh, uh, by uh, Gunnar Farnebeck uh, with, with GNUGO. Um, we had to get permission from Richard Stallman to, um, to use a different licensing for, the, for the, uh, the particular files in the GNUGO distribution so that they could be used in a proprietary Program most of the most of the uh, files are licensed GPL, but um, the uh, the ones that operate the the protocol are licensed uh, BSD or X11, which which means that they could be taken and put into a proprietary program. So uh, there is a quick classification. So we could classify Go programs as commercial or research uh, or free. I guess the um, uh, the first two categories are. Um, not mutually exclusive, and the last two categories are not mutually exclusive. Uh, but a commercial program is one that you can buy from somebody, and these are always closed source. The free co programs include GNUGO and also some stronger ones, uh, particular Pachi is the strongest free Go program, um, and uh, uh, I'll come to these programs later. So a research program would be something like AlphaGo, which um, might or might not have uh, source code available to, to them. So I'm going to talk about GNUGO for a little bit. Um, so there was a, uh, um, an article in Byte magazine about a program called WALL-E by somebody named Jonathan Mullen. And Mon, Mon Lung Lee, who worked for Microsoft, um, took that and wrote a free Go program and, and, uh, uh, and uh, got it part of uh, GNU, which means it was distributed under a uh, 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 under the GPL as, as part of part of GNU, um, because it was 
pr open source, um, you could um, uh, you could take it and you could start modifying it. And it, I noticed that it would, was capable of some obvious improvements, uh, which would make it stronger. And uh, the, what I didn't realize was that once you start doing that, you get sucked in, and, and uh, it's like it takes over your life for a while. But so anyway, I, I wrote a program called Liberty 1.0, and that program is still available on the inter internet if you go to the KGS server. Somebody in Finland is running a, a Liberty uh, bot. Um, I don't know the person that's doing that. Um, so anyway, three things happened. I was contra contacted by Jan van der Steen in Holland, who had his own program called Liberty, and he objected to the use of the name. I was uh, contacted by Stuart Craycraft and Richard Stallman with the Free Found uh, uh, with the uh, Free Software Foundation and asked if we could take liberty and make it into gnu -Go. I was concerned that Mon Long Lee might not be happy about it, but uh, uh, he was okay with it, so we started working on it. I was contacted by another programmer uh, called, uh, named D David Denholm. He worked for Citrix UK, and so we started working on it. Uh, we were unable to release our code because the Free Software Foundation required a copyright assignment, and they required it from not only David, but also from his employer, Citrix. And Citrix was very slow about doing this. So the, the result was that we worked together without anybody else seeing our code for uh, several months. And finally, um, in, in April, we, um, we got the Citrix uh, um, uh, uh, software uh, copyright assignment, and so we were able to release gnu -Go. And immediately, other people wanted to work on it. Uh, I'll mention Gunnar Farnebeck because he was uh, probably the strongest, uh, strongest programmer. Um, he, he's somebody that works in computer vision, and he's, he's uh, very good. He had, he had a lot of vision about how the program should be developed. And, and uh, we made it into quite a, uh, uh, a uh, uh, respectable program, though still not at the level that, that a, a middle-level level amateur program pr uh, player would, would be challenged by it. It's, um, it's a good program for, for beginners. And, uh, and we had a lot of help from a lot of people. I've mentioned a few of them. Um, the development slowed after 2004. Gunnar got a job and he had a child and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and even more than that, we started realizing that uh, gnu -Go could not compete with the uh, Monte Carlo programs, which I'll discuss later. So th the last stable release was uh, 3.8 in 2009. Uh, and there's still a Git repository, somebody could um, uh, start enhancing it, would, but it would probably be better to start from, from, uh, uh, from scratch using a different paradigm. Um, so now I'm going, to, I'm going to show you some of the issues that face anybody uh, uh, that's um, programming. So uh, by reading, I mean search. Um, in computer chess, it would be called search, but, but uh, uh, reading means that you envision future positions in your in your mind, and you try to try to figure out what you can be can do. By in chess programming, it was found that brute force search that you you search an enormous move tree. Uh, evaluation of the terminal nodes in the tree is very easy, and so you can search an enormous tree, and you can basically uh, uh, find the best move by by means of, of that. That was sufficient to beat Gary Kasparov. That doesn't work in Go. And the reason is that in Go, evaluation of the terminal nodes of the tree is already a difficult task. So at the terminal nodes of the tree, you will find that some of the, the groups on the board are alive, some of them are dead, and some of them are critical. If there is a critical group on the board, that means that life or death of that group depends upon who's, who plays next. It may even be that there, there are, are adjacent dragons uh, one of each color, which are both critical, and, and one of them is going to die and one of them is, is going to, to survive, uh, and, and this is called semi-I. So, so the, um, uh, uh, the, the decision as to whether 
um, a group is alive, or dead, or critical itself requires quite a bit of analysis. This means that the evaluation of the terminal nodes in the tree are, are, um, is not trivial. So I, um, I'm going to show you um, an example. So I asked Ganugo to evaluate the, the position in the upper left-hand corner. So th this is a, a critical position. If white moves first, he can, he can kill. Uh, if black moves, uh, moves first, uh, then, uh, then it's possible to live. Um, so uh, the variations form a tree, which is displayed uh, down in the right-hand corner. So the, the very first uh, move, if you want to kill, is this one. And, it, it, and once this stone is placed, there's no way to live. Black can cut, try this way, but there's a refutation. And this group does not have two eyes, which, if you know the rules of the game, mean that it's, it's, it's dead. And, and even if you don't know the rules of the game, uh, it means that it's dead. So there's, there's, no way, there's no way for this group to live. And this, um, this sequence of moves uh, shows that. Um, there's, a, there's a variation. Instead of going here, black could try to go here. But that doesn't work either. On the other hand, if black plays first, this move forms two eyes. It carves out two separate eye spaces in the corner. And consequently, uh, there's, there's no way that this group can be killed. And, and uh, so Ganugo can figure this out, not too inefficiently. Um, but how does it do it? Well, it has to find the right move. So for example, here, uh, it has to find this move. And the comments here tell you what Gnugo did. Um, so I wonder, is that very readable? Oh, OK. Well, I'll tell you what it says. Um, so first it says A1303. OK, so now if you look uh, in the GNUGO source code, um, there are many patterns which are, um, which are encoded graphically like this. These were written by hand, uh, then they're compiled to C. Um, the, uh, um, the X's mean, in this case, black stones, and the, the O's mean white stones. The question marks means that the color of the stone is irrelevant the star is the move which is proposed by this pattern. And, and uh, if this pattern is found, then, then, uh, th then that move will be tried. And that's what happened. So the problem with this is that all of these patterns were hand-coded by, by people that were analyzing Gnugo's games, finding its mistake, saying, well, this this, it would play correctly if we change this pattern here. There's a uh, test suite uh, in, in which we, um, uh, uh, we run a bunch of tests, things that have been fixed in the past. If something else we do breaks them, then, then, then tests are going to start failing, and we'll, we'll find out that there's something wrong with the pattern that we've added. And this is, um, uh, this is time consuming, uh, and, and it, it uh, uh, is also of limited success uh, that, that um, uh, this is perhaps not, uh, not the way it should be done. It works up to a, up to a point. OK, so this is what I have to say about reading. The other thing I want to talk about is, is influence. And I'm going to use one of the AlphaGo games in order to illustrate this concept. Uh, so the ability of a group to live inside some region depends a lot upon the surroundings. If the opponent has a lot of uh, walls in the vicinity of, of that stone, then it may be difficult to, to, to live. And so we have sort of an intuition that, um, let's take this. This is, uh, this is the third uh, AlphaGo Lisa Dahl game. And I want to look at the, the, the bottom here. This region in the bottom is 
AlphaGo is white. White's influence in the bottom is very strong because it's completely surrounded by walls. Black could try to go in, and perhaps black could, could uh, uh, make life, but it's very unlikely. Nevertheless, Lee Sedol invaded uh, there, and this is because he knew that he was behind. He started to go in, and, and the fact that white's influence is so strong means that this is a very bold and courageous thing to do. So he, he, he makes a forcing move, and, and uh, AlphaGo doesn't even answer it. It plays, uh, it plays uh, up, up here. Um, the influence is so strong that it doesn't look like there's any way that black can make life. Nevertheless, black made, was able to make what's called the co, which is a kind of a situation where um, the life and death uh, depends upon the outcome of a fight that may globally involve other parts of the board. So this was, this was quite a success for Lisa Dahl was to make this co. Unfortunately, it wasn't good enough because um, he was not able to win the co. When I say that, that, that a co depends upon other uh, things that happen in other parts of the board, um, the rule of co, this st a stone has been, just been captured here. The rule of co says that black may not immediately recapture it. If he doesn't recapture it, white can fill there and win the situation. But since he cannot immediately capture it, the rule of co says he has to do something else. So he goes over here. He makes a co-threat. Um, a co-threat is a move in perhaps another part of the board, which has to be answered because, uh, because the gain that he would get from killing um, uh, something over there would be adequate compensation for losing the co. So AlphaGo answers it, uh, and so the co-fight continues. Unfortunately, AlphaGo had a local co-threat, a co-threat local to this situation, and Lee Sedol realized that he did not have enough co-threats outside, so he resigned. The, I've digressed a little bit to show you part of the game, but I want to make the point that influence, meaning sort of the sense that these white stones, if I do this, you can see, these white stones sort of radiate a power that fills up this space. That's our intuition. Uh, but somehow uh, capturing that idea is, is an important issue in Go programming. So um, we need to have we need to have an influence function. So I'll go back to the So the the uh, um, the influence function first appeared in the very first pro program in, in 1968, this program of, of uh, uh, Albert Zobrist. Um, and this is, um, maybe I can show you. Uh, here, I, here I'm running GNU Go, and I'm asking it um, to do a bunch of analysis and show me the results. Uh, so it generates a whole bunch of, of different diagrams, of which um, This one shows the status of the, of the groups, what it believes is live and dead. It believes this group up in the upper corner is critical, but in fact, uh, uh, Lee Sedol is, is alive up there. Ganugo has that evaluated wrong. This shows the influence, and you can see at the bottom here that uh, of, so, so the influence is actually a number. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the green is is very strong influence, but then other colors, uh, red uh, 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 red means um, a low amount of influence. Uh, yellow means a medium amount of influence. The influence function is intended to capture the the uh, the intuition that. These white stones are radiating some quality 
which controls whether it's possible for black to live or die inside. Up until around 2006, all Go programs, we believe, worked more or less the same way. Of course, we haven't seen the source code to, to, uh, to uh, 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 the commercial programs, but we have some idea how they work. Uh, uh, really, I, I kind of showed you that there's hand-coded patterns which determine the, the reading, and there's an influence function, and, and uh, all of these programs probably uh, uh, are very similar in architecture. Uh, but then uh, the Monte Carlo programs came on the scene. They still require a, a, uh, a database, but they have much better success. And then very recently, the uh, Monte Carlo methods have been supplemented by, by deep learning. Uh, before I come back to these things, I'd like to mention uh, a couple of things. Combinatorial game theory is sort of a digression because the ideas of combinatorial game theory haven't been very much uh, applied within Go. Nevertheless, uh, they're very good uh, at analyzing end games. Uh, combinatorial ga game theory is a branch of mathematics. It was uh, found, the first papers that I'm aware of, were, uh, there was a paper by John Milner in 1953, and then John Horton Conway came on the scene and he, he uh, uh, developed it into a really a uh, branch of mathematics. And uh, uh, so these, these books are, are quite excellent and well worth your, your time if you happen to pick one up. Um, I will mention that one of the hotbeds of Go development was the uh, University of Alberta in Edmonton. Martin Muller was, was a postdoc in Ber Berkeley working with, with uh, Elwin Berlinkamp. He's a six-time Go player. And then they, anyway, he went to Edmonton and he founded a research group. And a lot of good stuff has come out of there. In particular, the AlphaGo developers uh, came out of Edmonton. They, they went to England and developed AlphaGo, but, but, but they, uh, they got their start in, uh, in Edmonton and, uh, uh, and uh, many other developments came out of there. So I'm, now I'm going, going to talk about Monte Carlo methods. So the idea of Monte Carlo search would be that instead of searching a limited move tree, spending a lot of time evaluating uh, the terminal nodes, maybe you just read all the way out to the end of the game. At that point, there's no issue of life or death. So, so you don't have to, um, you, you don't have to uh, um, uh, waste time deciding whether a group is alive or dead, which if you make a mistake, will Will, uh, uh, will, will invalidate your evaluation of the terminal node in the move tree. You just read it out to the end and then everything is obvious. The dead stones uh, can even be removed from the board. Um, so, so you sort of play, uh, not completely randomly, but you, you, you use a, 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 a pattern matcher that, that is, is uh, um, uh, tuned for speed, and then you, you make many trials. And from the data that you collect, maybe you can figure out the best move. So the origin of the algorithm which is used now is called UCT1. And it, um, uh, it addresses the following problem. Suppose that you have a large number of slot machines. And, you're, you're, and they might not all be equal. Maybe some of them pay better than, than others. Um, you want to figure out which ones you should be playing. So you want to play the one that seems to be winning, but you don't want to neglect the other ones because if you do, you might be missing uh, one. Uh, maybe you have a bad luck with one machine for a while, but it's actually better. So, so there's a... There's a a deterministic strategy for doing this, which is called UCT1, you maximize the following function. So the first one, for J is the number of the machine. And I see I can't move the cursor left hand. Uh, uh, the first term is the average rate of payoff of this machine. And so clearly you should play that, play 
the machine that gives you the best payoff. But the second factor decreases as you play a lot of, um, if you play that machine a lot, it decreases slowly enough that you're also playing the other machines. So this is called UCT1. And it can also be applied to tree search. Now this was um, first done by these um, Hungarian guys uh, uh, whose names I would probably mispronounce. Um, uh, they were not interested in Go programming as far as I know, but they, they, uh, they adapted uh, the UCT algorithm to tree search. And then Sylvain Jolie was uh, in, in his uh, dissertation applied this to, to, uh, to, to Go, and this became a renaissance uh, thing. Um, oh, I see there's a sentence that's missing here. His, his dissertation also used um, uh, reinforcement learning, which, 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 is, uh, which is a key principle in, in training neural nets. So, so, uh, um, uh, and then he went on to author a, uh, uh, a Go program called MoGo, and, and MoGo had some success. Um, so in 2008, uh, uh, MoGo played a game with uh, Myung Hwan Kim, uh, who, uh, who is a nine don professional. If you watched the, uh, uh, the, the videos of, of the AlphaGo match, um, there were two sets. One, one was commentated by uh, uh, Michael Redmond and Chris Garlick, but the one to watch was, was uh, commentated by Myung Hwan Kim. Um, and um, uh, so so he has, he's, a, he's a professional Go player. He's a nine don, which means he has the highest uh, 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 rank that you can get, but he's still not quite at the top. He's not as strong as, as Lee Sedol, for example. He lives in Los Angeles and he teaches. And, and uh, yeah, he, he lost by one and a half points. He lost a nine stone game to, uh, to Mogo. Nine stone is a big handicap. So you can see from that statement how far we've come since, 19, uh, since 2008. Um, and then just uh, three years ago, um, a couple of, of Monte Carlo programs, Zen, which is authored in Japan, and, and Crazy Stone, which is authored in France, defeated a couple of the former world champions, uh, um, uh, Masaki Takamiya and, and uh, uh, Yoshio Ishida. Both were um, at the top of, of, the, of the Go scene uh, you, you know, in, in the 1970s. And, and uh, so although they're um, uh, uh, like my age or something, they're, they're, um, uh, they're still considered top players. And at that point it seemed, and in fact just until a year ago, it seemed that the top programs were four stones weaker than, uh, than the top professionals. A four stone handicap is a big handicap, but it's not, um, it's not so big that this wasn't impressive. It was very impressive. Um, but nobody was prepared uh, for, for uh, the recent developments. Neural nets have had amazing success in the last five years in, in, in all sorts of things, uh, such as, as uh, image recognition and, and medical diagnostics and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, and, and they've, the, um, uh, the key to this have, have been faster processors, particularly the use of, of GPUs, uh, which were designed originally to display computer graphics, but were repurposed for, for, uh, for training and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and evaluating neural nets. So uh, there's a, uh, I can give you a, uh, another demonstration. So this is a neural net which actually is written in JavaScript and it actually plays in the, in, in the browser. Uh, so this is by some guys in Edmonton, I don't, in, excuse me, Edinburgh uh, in, in Scotland. So, so this neural net has very good intuition. It plays quite well. And if you, if, you, uh, if you play with it, you'll be surprised at how well it plays, given the fact that it's not doing any, any reading. Uh, it, it, uh, in order to defeat it, 
um, you should start a fight and make some trouble. And then it starts making mistakes. But uh, in, in terms of playing the opening and, and uh, developing uh, influence and, and everything, uh, it plays just amazingly well. Uh, it's written in JavaScript. You can go to GitHub and, 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 uh, and get the source code if you want to see it. Um, and and uh, so neural nets give a much better way of pattern recognition than you saw with GNUgo. What did we do with GNUgo? We had handwritten programs, that handwritten patterns that were written by, by humans. If, if a pattern is missing, then, then you have to code it by hand. In, in this case, what they did, and in the case of AlphaGo, what they did is that they, they trained the neural net by, by, uh, by playing a lot of, um, uh, replaying a lot of uh, professional games that, they, they, uh, uh, that had been archived. And in the case of AlphaGo, they did something else, which is they allowed the, 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 the machine to play itself, and they used reinforcement learning in order to tune the, the, uh, the, the neural net. So, so um, neural nets are quite amazing. They're also kind of scary. Um, I mentioned some of the intangible th things that uh, are part of the art of playing Go. Vinyl points and tosujis are key points in a position. So you want to occupy the vital point. Uh, the, uh, the relevant intuition is called shape, that, that you, you try to have good shape. And, and, uh, uh, but not only that, but you, timing is very important because you, you need to play the moves in exactly the right sequence in certain situations. If you play things in the wrong order, then, then there will be a refutation. So, um, so it's, it's very delicate. The neural nets are, and also I mentioned st thickness and decision to sacrifice stones in order to gain thickness. These are all intangible things, but the neural nets are often able to find the right move. Uh, for example, the, the, uh, the neural net that I just showed you, um, uh, and, and obviously the ones uh, that are used by AlphaGo. I should mention Facebook also has a, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a program which, as far as I know, has a similar al architecture to AlphaGo and is you know, perhaps uh, uh, a little bit behind AlphaGo. It, it plays on the KGS server. It was quite remarkable to see how fast it improved. And I think if AlphaGo hadn't come on the scene, then maybe Dark Forest would have uh, uh, taken its uh, uh, place. So the AlphaGo architecture is discussed in a, uh, uh, in a Nature article. They have two neural networks. They have a slow policy network. This is good at choosing the moves. Uh, the rollout policy is, 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 is not so good at finding the right moves, but it's very fast. And so for the Monte Carlo method, you want to play the game out uh, 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 into the, uh, 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 perhaps to the end. And so, the, uh, so you need two different styles of play there. And so they have two neural nets. These were trained by, by, uh, uh, by self-play. And if you want more information, there you can find the, the, the Nature article. So uh, I guess I had a, um, we have a few minutes. So, so I could look at some of the AlphaGo games. And I also have a, um, Lisa Dahl uh, is arguably the, the, the strongest player. There's a, a young Chinese guy who thinks he's, he's uh, stronger because he defeated Leif Sadal more in tournament play. But um, um, uh, Lee Sadal has been at the top for 10 years, and, and uh, um, he's, he's right in his prime. And these games were, were, were played very well by, by Lee Sadal. He didn't make mistakes. Uh, what, rather, what happened was that um, uh, things happened that um, would not be considered a mistake by human standards. He wasn't prepared for AlphaGo because AlphaGo prepared, played some, some games in, uh, in, in October against Fan Hui, who was uh, uh, maybe the strongest player in Europe. He's a professional 
uh, to Don. And, and uh, AlphaGo won all those games, but they were not impressive because AlphaGo played very cautiously. This is uh, typical of the Monte Carlo programs is that it's very easy to underestimate them because they know if they're ahead. And you may not, you know, a position may seem evil even to a, uh, to a human observer or, or, or player, but, but, but uh, the, the Monte Carlo program uh, has a better sense than you do of, of, of whether it's ahead or not. So it may play very cautiously, and the play may therefore not be impressive. So Lisa Dahl didn't know how strong AlphaGo was, and um, he, played, he played an unusual move right at the beginning. This move is um, not uh, a standard opening move. Uh, probably his reasoning was that uh, he thought that maybe AlphaGo had a book, and the problem is to get out of the book. Um, so, so you play a, a move that's a little bit non-standard. And AlphaGo cooperated by letting Black build up his side. So now Black has to play lightly on the top and settle things, but Lisa Dahl is good at that. Um, this move is probably an overplay, and he might not have played it if he had realized at this point how strong AlphaGo was. So AlphaGo did this, and this move is also uh, Black's chance to back off, but he didn't black back off. And now th these, these, uh, these black stones are cut off. Uh, that's okay. Lisa Dahl is perfectly capable of making life. Uh, now now uh, white has been cut into three parts. And uh, although black stones here are kind of in trouble, these stones are, are, are now perhaps settled. Uh, but these stones are potentially in trouble, and black can use that in order to make life. So after, after uh, black goes this, white has to go back and defend. And, uh, and, and black goes here, and at this point, uh, to, um, to somebody like me, it might look as if uh, black has some danger that the black stones still can die. But in fact, there's just enough uh, uh, potential in the situation that black can live. But white has gained some power on the right, on the left hand side. And after this, neither player really made any mistakes. And when the smoke cleared at the end of the game, black, Lisa Dahl, has made some, some, uh, uh, some territory down here. But white is getting territory on the top. And here, AlphaGo played some moves that people would not think of. So this is, um, this is a very surprising and unusual move, but it's okay. And AlphaGo's, AlphaGo knows exactly how much it needs in order to win, which it does. It has to invade on the right-hand side Uh, but this invasion is kind of un non-obvious, and I believe that Lisa Dahl was taken by surprise. Uh, there was a lot of... Um, okay, so, um, so White, AlphaGo, has succeeded in catching some stones up here, and also living in this corner down here, and also taking a large territory here, and although uh, it's given up some territory here, it knows exactly uh, that it's ahead, and, and after a little while, Lisa Dahl gave up. Um, people tended, af after a while, people tended to anthropomorphize AlphaGo. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe I'll show you uh, a video of, of uh, Myung-Hwan uh, uh, Myung Kim. I mentioned him. He was the one that played Mogo. He always referred to AlphaGo in, in the female. So, so she did this or she did that. And, and his commentaries are, 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 are very good. The fourth game was the, the, uh, the one that Lisa Dahl won by playing a brilliant move. Let's see. In game four, AlphaGo slowly got an advantage. Lisa Dahl is white.
he more or less made some forcing moves. And, and the, the real way to go is that forcing moves can be thought of as being light, that you can give them up. If you make forcing moves, you give them up. And so, so he's not committed to saving these, these, uh, these white stones uh, here. They were, they were, uh, they were played as, as forcing moves. But nevertheless, AlphaGo seems to have captured them. And although White, Lisa Dahl, has, has gone in compensation there, it looks as if he's behind at this point. Lisa Dahl played a brilliant sequence. He, uh, at this point, he thought for about half an hour before he played this move. And, and he, he didn't have that much time on his clock. So, so uh, uh, by, the, the, by the time the sequence was over, he was very short on time. And then he played this move. This move is a move that I would not think of, most players would not think of, um, uh, yet it is the only move that works in this situation. AlphaGo could have played better. Uh, there was another way in which, in which uh, 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 Black could have um, uh, uh, partially recovered this, but at that, if, if that had happened, it would have been a, a very close game. Um, the reason that this works depends upon complicated sequences. Uh, and um, after this, AlphaGo started making mistakes, which is something that happens with Monte Carlo programs, that if they, if they are behind, they may, they may make some, some, uh, some errors. There is a, a remedy for, for that called an internal coming. Um, so if I, have, uh, I, if I have five minutes, maybe I'll play, play you five minutes of this YouTube video. Is, is that, is that okay? Okay, so, um, so this is Myung Hwan Kim and uh, Ha Jin Lee. Ha Jin Lee is a very popular blogger. Uh, she's a professional Go player, um, and she has a YouTube channel which is extremely popular. So she's... Um, He's the lady, and, and this is Myung, Myung Hwan Kim. He's the pro that lives in Los Angeles. And they're, they're struggling to, to figure out some variation. Uh, and they're, they're trying all different things. Lisa Dahl has not yet played. So Lisa Dahl is up in the upper, upper left hand corner. That's after you count. Okay. So 66 is what Mark Black has in the upper right. Yes. And the white, it's very difficult to count. Oh, without They're sort of in despair because they want Lisa Dahl to find something, but it doesn't look like you can. He's counting, he's evaluating the score. Let's have less than 10 points winning on the board mm -hmm. without counting anything on the bottom side in the set up. So we should make like 15 points. Right. 15 points, so six cycles is not um, very difficult to make. Right. It might be even sent Right, I think so. Why do we and need to say the three stones in the set? I believe I backed up too much, so I'm going to move it ahead a couple minutes. At this point, Lee Sadal has started to play, but he hasn't, he hasn't played the, the vital move. So you can see that this stone, the stone, the stone, uh, it, it was there and, and now it's disappeared. But it was on the board. So, so, so the commentators uh, had had actually found this move, uh, the the move that Lee Sedol played. Um, ha Jin Lee uh, found it in the middle of a long sequence. Uh, and then, and then Myung Han Kim found it at the right place, but he couldn't decide whether it worked or not. And they, and they, were, they were analyzing until, until finally uh, um, uh, uh, Lisa Dahl played the move, and then they continued to analyze. Uh, it's, it's a very dramatic video, and, and uh, uh, 
perhaps I perhaps I I I should should stop. But if, if but um, uh, if you're interested in in in, uh, in this, it's it's high drama on the go board, and uh, everybody, even if they're you know kind of interested in seeing progress in computer go, was rooting for Lisa Dahl. That that uh, from the from the human angle, he. Um, uh, he just showed so much, um, uh, you know, uh, character in, in, in the way he conducted the, the, the match. And, and it was good that he, he got a win. At the same time, there, there was a tendency to perhaps anthropomorphize uh, AlphaGo a little bit. AlphaGo was awarded a, a trophy uh, or 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 a uh, an honorary nine don certification by the Korean Go Go Association, who who uh, uh, praised AlphaGo's sincere efforts to improve at the game, and and uh, uh, you know because it involves neural nets, there's something which is perhaps not not a mind there, but it's it's uh, uh, it's it's getting there that 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 there's uh, um, there's there's elements of true thought in 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 in, uh, in AlphaGo, unlike the computer chess programs that that uh, happened in the 1990s. So I'll stop there. Mm -hmm.